Hello, my name is Dick Peeney. Welcome to my show. Today we're going to talk about Libya. Over 30 years ago, Muammar Gaddafi took over the north coast of Africa uh, country of Libya. Since then, with increasing sanctions and travel restrictions, little has been heard of this desert community. Many have forgotten that it was once one of our most stable allies. We had good trade agreements and even a substantial air base there. But it appears that Libya may be coming out of the shadows again. And with that in mind, let's go back to those days before. I joined the Air Force in 1952. I went to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio for basic training. And here I am home on leave and retrieved my car and went to California where I was sent to George Air Force Base in the Mojave Desert for a couple of years. It was good that I got used to desert conditions because my next assignment was to Africa. And here we are flying over the Atlantic in a military propeller transport. At this time, ditchings at sea were still quite common. And uh, when you heard any little fluctuation in the sound of the motors, you were immediately wide awake. It took about 22 hours to go across the entire flight. We made a stop at uh, lodges in the Azores for fuel. And uh, the runway here extends off on both sides of the island. There's a mountain on either side of it so that you, uh, if you make a mistake in any direction, front or back or right to left, you're in, in big trouble. And besides that, we landed in a pea soup fog where the, uh, you didn't see the runway until you were down to about 100 feet. This is the control tower at uh, Lodges Field in the Azores. Here we, then we flew on to uh, Casablanca and uh, stopped for fuel. Here we're at the end of the runway waiting for another plane to land. Libya is about a thousand miles wide in either direction and is equal to the area of the U.S. east of Indianapolis, but it only has the population equal to the state of Connecticut, most of them living within a few miles of the Mediterranean. The uh, capital is Tripoli, but uh, Qaddafi rules from El Baya, which is over near Benghazi on, on the far side of the uh, province here. Here we are landing at Wheelis Air Force Base just outside of Tripoli. It was established in February 1948. It's uh, MATS or Military Air Transport Command Base. It was also one of the, the bases that we had to uh, contain the expanding threat of communism. It was a former uh, World War II Italian fighter strip known as Malaha, which means salt flats. And the salt flats are still uh, in operation. These are uh, using uh, evaporation of seawater to uh, obtain salt. And these are right within the compound of the base. Wheelis Field is a small American city of about 8,000 within a walled compound. It's on the coast a few miles east of uh, the capital city of Tripoli. Before the war, it was also a, uh, the site of the Malaha Grand Prix auto race track. And uh, this is the track right here. It comes down around. This is part of the old race track. This is the uh, Navy Douglas R6D, which is the same as the DC-6 that I traveled in. The uh, MATS overlaps all of the services, so some of the planes may be Army or, and some of them are Air Force and some are Navy. This is the control tower. It's probably left over from the original Italian base. Uh, Libya was occupied by Italy before the war. But we had some modern barracks. Uh, here we see those nice ones with, uh, complete with date palms ready, ready to be harvested. Got a very nice little chapel. 
And uh, this is part of the old uh, Malaha racetrack. We're looking down here and uh, notice the old yellow stop sign. And the sign on the, it says, walk on the left facing traffic, and it's in three languages, Italian and Arabic, besides the English. This is the base theater. And uh, this banked uh, road that you see right in front of you is part of the bank track of the old racetrack. This is the NCO club and a service club. This is quite, quite a nice, uh, nicely established uh, base. We even had a zoo, and this, this is one of the native animals. It's called a wadan. It's a type of antelope that has a long beard that hangs that way down between its front legs. And an African crowned crane. And we had a very beautiful beach. It was, it was uh, right on the banks of the beautiful blue Mediterranean. The only thing that there was, there, there weren't any girls. Here's a view from the air. You can see the, uh, we had the uh, raft that you could swim out to. And way out next to the edge here was uh, some reefs that you could dive down. And there even were some old uh, wrecks of boats down there. But if you had a scuba set, you could go and look at those. But after you were there a while, it, it sort of got to look like this. And it was time to go to town. Around, uh, the main wall of the base is completely surrounded with this stone wall, and on the top of it, broken glass is set to uh, discourage people from climbing over the top. But uh, there were a few that uh, mastered this by uh, just throwing a big tarp over the thing and sort of hooking it in the glass and going right over. And uh, there, were, there were quite uh, a few things that disappeared over the wall. This is the uh, main gate going to town. These are the old Italian buses that we rode to town. They were, they were sort of handmade buses. They were, were not exactly uh, square and true. They were sort, sort of looked like they'd been uh, made up in, in uh, manual training shop. This is the road to town. So everything was sort of narrow, uh, narrow roads with walls on each side. This is an Arab well along the road. Uh, this is powered by a cow here, and he runs up and down a ramp. And the rope goes up over the top here, over the pulley, and down into the well. And there's a, a goatskin bag at the bottom of it. And when, when the bag comes up, there's another bar here, and it flips over, and it dumps the, the, the bag out, and it goes down into this reservoir over here. And then the, as the cow comes back up, you know, the whole thing is repeated. And the cow walks up and down the uh, thing most of the day. This is a little town called Sukaljuma. This means Friday market. This is on the way to town to the main uh, city of Tripoli. Notice the uh, drifting sand on the bottom of the uh, picture here. It is, there was always just a little wisp of sand blowing across everything. Another view in uh, Sukaljuma. Now this is an aerial view of the uh, harbor of Tripoli. You can see the main uh, breakwater here. And, and uh, this, this is the uh, Italian part of the city, and this is the old Arab part of the city on this side. Getting a little closer to town, you can see some of the uh, farms in the area. They're mostly like, like little truck farms of uh, vegetables and, and uh, private homes. This is the walled city of Tripoli. This is just inside the wall. And here you can see more of the dust blowing. And uh, this is the typical uh, barbed wire fence. It is a wall with a uh, prickly pear cactus growing on the top of it. It's very effective. So this is a map of the uh, area. Here is the city of Tripoli, and here is Wheelis Field. This is the old racetrack where that laid in the, in the uh, area of, uh, and, and the salt pans are out in the middle here. Here's Sukajuma. Here is the wall around the city of Tripoli. This is the more modern part where the Italian uh, influence was, and this is the old city, it was the Arab city. 
that has been there for thousands of years. And this, this represents the, uh, the sort of the oasis that's along the uh, coast. From here on in, it all, all uh, goes into desert quite suddenly. This is a big uh, hotel called the Wadan Hotel. This is where all the uh, European people stayed. This, this was the, uh, the nicest place in town. And this, this had a very effective uh, security system. There was a guy who stood at the top of the stairs, and anybody that didn't belong there didn't get in. This is the uh, taxi system they call these Garys, or horse-drawn uh, cabs. And uh, when there wasn't any, uh, when they weren't using the cabs, they played uh, checkers on these squares in the street here. They, they had them marked off which ones were the red and the black, and then they, they used uh, different colored uh, stones, and they played checkers on the street. Uh, notice the, the uh, woman with her face covered here. This was the uh, typical Arab garb. She covered up entirely except for peeking out with one eye whenever she was out in, in public. This is a view of the harbor. There's quite, quite a bit of trade uh, coming and going. This is a statue along the Lungomari. This is the, uh, the main uh, road that runs right along the harbor. This is looking uh, back up toward the cathedral uh, circle. There's a, just beyond those three arches is a little traffic circle, and it's sort of a parkway that leads up to the cathedral. And this is those arches from the other side. This is the little traffic circle called uh, Cathedral Circle. And this is a little fountain that's in between the arches. And this is the cathedral. Now this is, this is in the Italian section. This is the way a lot of the streets look. This, this is a, a little Italian signorina riding her bicycle here. And, and up the street is, is the dome of the uh, King's Palace. Now at this time we had, had uh, Libya had a king, was King Idris, and he was about 60 years old and had no heirs, and uh, he uh, had four wives, but uh, he didn't have any heirs, and he went, he went to Egypt and uh, on a trip and Qaddafi wouldn't let him come back, and that's how Qaddafi took over in a bloodless coup. So this is looking down some of the streets in the Italian area. This, this is the uh, Sharia 24 December, which is uh, the day of the Libyan independence in 1951. But these are mostly Italian shops here, but the, this is the Libyan flag hanging up over the street there. And this is Sharia et al. Omar Mukhtar. Uh, Omar Mukhtar was one of the heroes that uh, was uh, instrumental in uh, getting Libya its independence. Notice the uh, license plate on the car to the left there is, is uh, in both uh, American numerals and Arabic numerals. Another uh, shot on uh, Sharia Omar Mukhtar. We're back now along the beach. This is, is uh, on the Lungamari. This is the Grand Hotel. There's an old English uh, Land Rover going along there from the British Army. They were still uh, quite active in the area, too. This is the uh, President's Palace, and, and uh, on the right was the uh, British Engineers Club. And then we come to the castle. This, this is uh, the castle of the Barbary Pirates. It was run by the Karamanli family for about two centuries. Notice the two pillars in the front of it. One has a ship on it representing the Phoenicians, and the other has the uh, statue of Romulus and Remus representing Rome. There you can see the, uh, the statue of those Romulus and Remus were, were uh, were supposed to have been suckled by a wolf, and and uh, that's that's the uh, representation picture of Rome. Right? 
in uh, 1804, the first skirmishes between the U.S. Navy and the Marines took U.S. Navy and Marines took place here. So it was not settled until 1815. Hence the Marine song from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. This kind of shows the limits of the castle. Uh, over here, this is called Castle Square, and you can see the old part of the castle here. This was probably uh, built by the Spanish as far back as 1510. And there you can see the two pillars there. And there is the uh, Lungamari from the castle. You can see the pillars there. This is another view of the uh, castle square. Now this used to be the moat. Right in through here was a moat around the, uh, the castle. This is the uh, Shell Oil Company here and, and the uh, Banco de Roma there. Now this is the same place in 1941 when it was occupied by the Africa Corps under the heading of Marshal Erwin Rommel. And they, they drove their tanks down the main street and then circled part of them back and came through again to give everybody the idea how many there were, that they were, they were insurmountable, that they, they couldn't possibly be overcome because they had so many tanks. And mo most of them they saw three or four times. Now here's a view of the pillars looking out to the harbor. The uh, Phoenicians were trading in this area at a th in 1000 BC. And the earliest remnants of settlements date back to about 500 BC of the Phoenicians. Now this is the same view of the, the British uh, re-entry into uh, Tripoli in 1943, and they're piped in by the Gordon Highlanders. This was after Rommel had been routed at El Alamein. They were headed by Field Marshal Montgomery. This is a bird's eye view of the castle in 1559 from an engraving at Florence. Note the moat and the cannons. Tripoli has changed hands many times and each has added something to the castle. The Romans took it from the Carthaginians in 146 BC. Then came the Numidians, the Vandals, the Byzantines, Arabs, Berbers, Knights of Malta, and the Ottoman Turks took it in 1551 and it became a barbarian pirate stronghold. The, the uh, Karamani family ruled from uh, 1740 to 1835. The Italians took over in 1911, and the British during World War II, and finally independence in 1951. Note the location of the city wall here. This, this is the old city main gate. And this wall went across, and there was, there was actually a bridge went over the moat here. Now the next picture is, is the, uh, what they call the St. George Bastion on the same corner. Here's the city wall and the old bridge that went over the top. And this is now the street was at one time the moat. And there is another, another view of this. This was at one time the moat is now made into a city street. This is inside the castle gardens. There were gardens and harems and courts, and, and uh, they eventually built this road through the middle of it to uh, release some of the traffic going in and out. And uh, when they dug down underneath, they found uh, old Roman pillars buried underneath the castle walls. Well, this is a, a more of that picture of the uh, old engraving from 1559. This is the old city showing the, the city wall going all the way around it with the castle here. And uh, notice there's some sort of a domed monument here. And out here are a couple of fortified islands. And uh, this, this is the harbor going up this way around it and circling back. Well, here we're going to go into the old city now. You notice there's a mosque there just beyond the gate. And uh, all these little uh, shops out in front are, are portable shops. And they, uh, at night, they just sort of all fold them up, and, and everything goes back inside, and, and they hook a donkey on and, and haul them away. At night, there's none of them there.
This is uh, uh, just a little bit inside the city. It's still, still quite open and, and uh, fairly uh, modern looking, but uh, as you go further back, it gets a little bit more uh, cluttered. Here's an old grocery store. It's a combination grocery, pots and pans, and everything in this. Notice the watermelon out in front. But as you go further back into the old city, it gets more like this. And it uh, gets, gets kind of scary. And it's best, best not to go uh, less, less than about four down in this area, and uh, never at night. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, street people that live in here that uh, don't seem to have homes and a few kids running around. This is uh, another market area. The, uh, the bread smelled real good, but when you looked at it, it, it uh, had been laid on, on the ground or in, on things, and there was, there was a lot of dirt on the bottom of the bread. You'd have to cut that off to, before you ate it. And of course, there's the, the rug merchants, and, and uh, you never want to pay the first price that's asked to. They always expect to haggle on, on the price of rugs. So we stopped here. This, this is at a place called the Oriental Cafe. Of course, we, we went native there. That's me on, on the uh, left. And uh, the, uh, we, we all had to have our, our uh, uniforms so we looked like everybody else. So the Oriental Cafe was, was, uh, had, had uh, the uh, proverbial ballet dancers, and, and uh, we had, had to take in that, of course. Well, then another thing that's in the old city is that this old uh, arch of Marcus Aurelius. And this dates to, I think, 146 BC. And uh, it's the only. Uh, remainings of the old Roman city of Oia that was here at that time. This is the dome monument that uh, was along the coast, and I could not find much about it. Uh, it has uh, lions and, and uh, fairly modern writing on it, but it was, it was uh, I couldn't translate what it was about uh, to who it was actually uh, uh, made to. But out, of, out in the harbor are these old fortified islands, and they're, they're still there and still somewhat fortified. This is just a view from out in the harbor of the old city. You can see a couple of mosque towers standing up there. A little bit further up around the corner is, is the Italian beach. They called it the Lido. And you could also rent boats there. And here are a couple of signorinas out uh, sailing on the harbor. But now we're going into the country a little bit. This is a typical uh, Arab farm with the cactus fence. And, and at the corners of the building, you see the kind of little peaks that show up on, on the buildings. Here you can see a little planer. And they had an open courtyard in the center. And the well, of course, here with, with probably their cow that ran up and down. There, there was no driveway because they had no car. And they have their little, little uh, gardens around it. This is another uh, old Arab well. It's no longer in use. And as you went further out into the country, the, the uh, housing gets a little bit more primitive. Here we see there's a couple of donkeys here, and, and uh, those pretty pretty primitive uh, shelters. Now this is a map of the media Tripoli area, and uh, the name Tripoli comes from Tripolitania, which meant three cities. Well, the three cities were Sabratha, Oia, and Leptis Magna, were the three main cities of Tripolitania, and. Uh, all three were overdrawn by desert tribes and abandoned. Only Oia was reoccupied and became the city of Tripoli. The others were buried in drifted sand and forgotten until the Italians took over in 1911. Well, first we'll go to the west to visit Sabratha, and this is uh, the museum that you visit as you come in. 
There was a great increase in archaeology in the 1920s and 30s when excavation began and is still being carried out with the same methods just like in Indiana Jones. There is a map of Sabratha and uh, note uh, this, this is the entrance where we came in here and uh, this is the old Byzantine wall. There's a uh, forum here and a basilica and there's baths here and over here and there's a big theater here. So this is a view looking out across to where the forum is. You can see the pillars standing up there. There's a part of the pillars of the forum. The baths are over here on the end. And, and a lot of this area that's unexcavated uh, was private homes or shops. This was the, uh, the Temple of Serapis. And here's me holding up a pillar in the forum. And this is a mosaic floor in the Tipidarium, or the warm water bath. This was raised up off from the ground, and there were, were uh, tunnels underneath it, and they had furnaces that uh, forced the uh, hot air underneath the floor to warm the water. It has been partly undermined by the sea, and, and uh, you see part of the thing has, has collapsed off the edge. It was right on the edge of the sea coast. But uh, some of the other uh, ones have been uh, picked up and restored and are in the museum. And this, this is the uh, mosaic of Oceanus, the god of the sea, it has been removed into the museum. And also the uh, floor from the Justinian Basilica, which was built about 500 BC. These are all in the museum. Of course, the most outstanding ruin here is the theater. It was quite, quite an impressive thing. We, en we enter through an arch that is laid up without mar mortar. The wedge-shaped blocks are held in place just by their own weight against each other. The lower part of this theater was, was uh, cut out of the native rock, and, and uh, then it was overlaid with marble. You notice there's carving in, in the stone down here. We'll look at that a little later. The, uh, some of this has been uh, rebuilt and, and the, uh, reassembled to give you an idea what it was actually like. These passages come through from the outside. This is where you entered. And uh, this arch wall at one time went entirely around it. And it was sort of for ventilation up at the top. And there were, there were wooden bleachers that went all the way to the top of the wall there. This is looking east. This theater would hold about 5,000 people when it was complete. This is the stone carving in the front of the stage. And now time for a snack and a cool drink at the Restaurante. Now we're going to go uh, east to the other Roman city of Leptis Magna, near the town of Homs, is about 60 miles east of the base. But we'll look at a few things along the way as we go. The first picture will be right just outside the base here. This was Mussolini's winter home. And uh, this was built right on, this is part of the old uh, Malaha racetrack. So he had, he, had, uh, he was instrumental in getting the racing going there and, and uh, lived right on the, on the side of the track. This is a little Arab boy with the goat kid. That was his pride and joy. And here we see an Arab plowing using a cow and a wooden plow. There's a little chapel in an olive grove. This is a ruin of a fortified farm. There were many of these dotting the countryside, and no one remembers just who built them or for what. 
or what army destroyed them. This is the remains of a World War II German prisoner camp where English prisoners were kept during the war with the, of, uh, the tank war between Rommel and uh, the English. This is a rest stop at the little town of Garibuli, the little Arab market town. Notice the uh, Oia beer sign here. And also notice that the, uh, it's quite hot and you can see the sweat coming through their shirts. It was quite a hot trip. And this is the market day, and, and uh, don't you like to just get in there and mingle? Now they uh, poured all their stuff out on the ground here and, and uh, just sort of pawed through it. There's kettles and, and vegetables, and, and everything was just sort of on the ground, and everybody sort of rummaged around and, and uh, traded the, uh, probably, probably one thing for another rather than uh, you know, a lot of bartering, not so much money involved. There's a, a old donkey, he's got a, a hand-woven saddle out, out of uh, matting, and his feet are tied together so he won't run off. And this is the parking lot for camels. This is another fortified farm near Homs. The Germans occupied this one during World War II. The pattern on the side of the hill here is where the old landmines were removed. There were still a lot of mines around even after, at this time. It was about uh, seven years after the war, but they actually found a live mine right under the, the railroad track in Tripoli that had never exploded. Now we're coming to the village of Homs. Now this is the only paved road across the country. And the next major highway to the south is 1,500 miles away across the Sahara Desert, which comes right up to the sea at this point. Our uh, bus has finally reached the main gate of Lep Leptis Magna. Now the uh, the Phoenicians originally here were in 500 BC, and from about 100 BC to 350 AD was the Romans. And the, uh, then they abandoned it for a while, and then the Byzantine uh, came in about 500 AD. And then it was abandoned again until 1911. Now here's the entrance where we, we came in, where we parked the buses. We come in here, and, and uh, there's a big arch right at this intersection. And down here, this is the... Uh, uh, the theater here, this is the market, and you see there's two circles to it, and there were, there were two uh, sort of ring places. This actually was all covered at one time, and uh, there, were, there was a dome in the center of the ring, and then there was another ring around it, and then there were timbers that went all the way across, so this whole thing was roofed. The, here we have the forum, and here is the basilica. There is a couple of temples over in here, and this was the uh, original harbor that was there. It's all filled in with sand now. And this is the Wadi Lebda, the stream that still runs in there. And this is the, uh, the playing fields, the athletic fields, and the public baths. And here is the old 4th uh, century wall here, and this is the Byzantine wall. This was, was the latest wall that was put there. It's a smaller settlement there in the 500 BC. Well, here we're coming in down the main street, and, and this is the uh, arch to Septimus Severus. It was built in 203 AD. It was a four-sided Janus-type arch, and the cross street went through it the other way. And this is the carved relief from the Severus arch. This was all the way around the tops of the arch was, was all this carved relief. But the, the, uh, all the faces have been uh, defaced. This is a thing of the uh, Arabs of, of having any sort of a, a replica of a human person, and they de defaced all the faces on them. This is the Cardo, or the main street. On the left is a Chalcidicum. It was built in 11 AD. The arch on ahead is the uh, to Trajan, and that was built in 110 A.D. 
We're looking across the Chow City come to the theater. This is the inside of the theater. This was built about the time of Christ. A lot of nice statuary in this one. At the top of the temple is a temple to Ceres Taiki, a combined god of vegetation and good fortune. The ornamental wall at the back of the stage is called the Cine Franz and was done in memory of an honored actor, M. Septimus Aridius Agrippa. The lower levels were cut out of the bedrock and then paved with marble. This is the view of the city from the theater. On, on the left is the market, and uh, over here is the quay or the, or the harbor, and this is the uh, wall of the Byzantine wall with the Byzantine gate in it. This is the basilica, and this is the forum. And this is the Arch of Tiberius. This is the market. This is one of those center, uh, centers of those circles. This apparently had a dome over the top of it. The, uh, they called it a kiosk. Then it had radiating beams that went out to this other uh, outer uh, lip here, outer, outer portico. And some of these tables had uh, markings on them to, for the standard measures. Now this is the outer portico of the market. Uh, th this, this is the same, this is the one that had, they did one of them, they did the center, and one of them they did the outside ring. The other one at one time had a dome in the center of it too. And then there were also uh, beams that went over to these pillars that supported the rest of the roof. Now this is uh, from the top of the uh, basilica looking back toward the theater. This is the theater here, and this is the uh, market. Here is the uh, one that had the dome on it, and this is the one that was the open ring. And this whole wall part was, was part of the uh, covered market. And these places, again, in the center that are not uh, excavated, these are the smaller shops, and, and uh, that uh, not too much remains in those. They, they've excavated a few of them. You can see in, in spots there that have been excavated, but they're there wasn't a lot found in those. Well, this is the uh, basilica, and this is uh, was was originally built as the Roman uh, sort of a uh, theater, not a theater so much as, as a meeting hall. And then later in in the Byzantine time, it became a church, and you see they even have a pulpit left here in the center. Now, on each side of these two. Uh, pillars here that are very intricately carved. This also had, had a, uh, a, a wall across here and it had sort of like galleries along the side that, that you, like uh, a mezzanine floor in between. And you can see the holes in the wall where, where the uh, beams went across to the top of the pillars to make it roofed over. And this is a vertical shot of, of one of those pillars. They're very intri intricately carved. This is the uh, Basilica Severiana from 216 AD. And this is the entrance to the forum. And there's a different way of handling, uh, laying up a doorway without any, any mortar. It was a very uh, substantial uh, beam across the top of what they call lintel. This is the inside of the forum. It was about 10,000 square meters, and there were small rooms along the edges which may have been uh, supporting uh, shops or maybe uh, separate government offices. The, uh, there were car faces on, on some of the arches. They were to uh, Medusa and Nereid.
And now we're looking uh, back down toward, this is the uh, Byzantine Gate here from about 550. And uh, over here is the temple to uh, Liber Pater, or Bacchus, which is the god of revelry. And there's a temple of Rome and Augustus, who was about 1 BC over in this area. And this is the uh, harbor of the quay. And uh, it's all now silted in. This is the Wadi Lebda running out through the edge of it here. And uh, on the left was a lighthouse, and on the right was, was a Doric temple. These are some giant pillars that were found down along the, the uh, uh, harbor there. And they'd been shipped in, apparently, and never used. They had never been actually assembled and, and stood up anywhere. They were, they were something they were planning to build that never got built. This is the palestra, or sport grounds, about 125 AD. And uh, it's probably the racetrack around the outside and in the center where the other, other game is very similar to our present day Olympics. So they had shot putting and, and whatnot in the center and, and the racetrack around the outside. And on the left is the bath. This is a public bath. It was an open place, uh, like a big swimming pool that you could actually swim in. Then there were also uh, separate private baths for men and women. And there were uh, the frigidariums, the tepidariums, and the caldridariums, which was the three different temperatures that you could have. And they were heated by uh, furnaces from under the floor. And the water was brought in by uh, aqueduct 12 miles from the Wadi Came. Now this, this was the latrines, and uh, this was a marble bench with holes cut in it. And uh, it was a, had a full flowing uh, water running underneath this to keep them constantly flushed. And uh, there was one place where the fellow had marked out his spacing and he'd got it wrong. And uh, then they had to cut the hole over a little bit further because it was not spaced right. And that marking where he uh, made his mistake is still showing there after 2,000 years. This is the, the great nymphaeum or fountain. And you notice that uh, part of it is missing over here. And there it is, it's tipped over. The Wadi Lebda undermined the back side of it and, and uh, it tipped over probably hundreds of years ago because the uh, Wadi Lebda is nowhere close anymore at this time. It has moved away by some flood or, or something that washed out the uh, foundation underneath the back of this. Well, now after a hot day in the, in the uh, sun of looking at all these ruins and they reflect and, and uh, it's quite, quite a hot job. This fountain in the shade was a lifesaver. Or you could go and, and buy a Kitty Cola, which was the local, local uh, cola brand that you could get and you buy it from the desert kids here. But our next trip will be to the uh, mountain town of Gary Ann and there we're gonna go inland on this road here and up up a uh, big escarpment up onto the mountain here. You can see this is the higher area. Here's the town of Gary Ann. Well, as you start out, it isn't very far out of Tripoli. You run into desert. And uh, this, this is the, they call the Zabia Desert. And this has got, had the hottest re record temperature on Earth was recorded here, 136 degrees in the shade. But after about 30 miles of desert, a high mountain ridge starts appearing ahead of you called the Gibel. And you start to see some oases of a few palm trees. Then we start the torches climb up the mountain. The uh, elevation at the top is about 2,000 feet higher and marginally cooler. So the next stop was at an old prison camp. This, this was another German prison camp where they kept the uh, English during World War II. And on, on this uh, 
walls were some murals that the uh, prisoner painted while they were there. This, these are the soldier's dream. And then there was a big one in, in the mess hall. And uh, this one started out to be just a pinup thing, and, and, uh, but it later developed into a map of the Mediterranean and showing all the operations of the war. Here's, here's Tripoli and Miserata and, and Bizerti and, and uh, all the places, Alexandria. This would be over in, in uh, where Lebanon is. This, this, uh, and uh, they added all these different things, all the different things that were going on, the bombing raids and the tank attacks and everything were all taken care of on the map and became, became the newspaper of the camp. And this is how they could, were uh, kept track of what was going on in the war while they were prisoners. It was called the Lady of Gary Ann. This is the main street in Gary Ann. It's a little bit greener up here, but not a lot. And uh, there was a continual uh, passage of herds and, of sheep and goats and, and camels. And, and uh, here we have the straw that broke the camel's back. Now this fellow, he's, he's pretty lucky. He's got the equivalent of uh, two trucks and a motorcycle. And these are dwellings in pits. They call them uh, tropophytes. They're carved out around these central pits. And uh, at first, the uh, relative coolness was, was great. But uh, soon, the uh, lack of ventilation overwhelmed you. So they're quite, quite uh, stuffy in there. There was no way to get air because they were down in the pit. Well, this is our final view for the day. This, this is the uh, view off the Gebel looking back toward uh, Tripoli. Well, I still have my old Fez that I bought over there. We'll have more about Wheelis Field and, and uh, Tripoli and Malta and even up to Athens and Germany in a future program. Thanks for watching.